But what happens eventually over time is what I think happened to these people I see in Facebook who have these very colorful families. When you are around people who you think are different and you grew up around the dinner table, you hear your father talk about these people in very bad language, but you grow up and you're around them and you, you see them every day, you realize they're people. Welcome to Share.Care, an all-inclusive community sharing experience, strength, and hope to create strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Share.Care communities work toward every individual feeling safe, valued, and heard, free from the threat of danger, pain, or harm. Each episode, founder Damian Andrews explores the principles underpinning Share.Care, and invites expert special guests to share their knowledge so you can easily reap the benefits so many others experience. You hold the choice to create your future. Let it be with strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Hello and welcome to the Share.Care podcast. Our belief is that global peace starts at home. Feeling safe, valued and heard gives you a foundation to confidently step out and make the world a happier and safer place for everyone. Because in today's world, it's in your own interest to help others. And today, it is my wonderful and great pleasure to welcome Mr. David E. Feldman. Now, David is the author of eight books of his own, plus he's also ghostwritten many others. He also has overcome drug addiction, depression, spinal problems that were heading for paralysis, two hip replacements, an intestinal resection with a colonostomy and cancer. Now, David, in spite of all this, David's stories are about love, transcendence, and hope. And he aims to inspire people to transcend their health challenges, fear and depression and trauma while entertaining and engaging people. Welcome, David. Pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks so much, Damien. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's it's an amazing story that you've gone through and some of the looking into your background and the research that we've done before this show. Um, some of the things you've gone through are pretty intense. Do you want to take us, would you like to take us into the Wayback Machine? Now, you might remember this as a silver DeLorean that Doc Brown invented. And when you hit 88 miles an hour, you could travel through time. Do you want to jump in that? I'll sit in the passenger seat and you floor it to 88 miles an hour and take us back in time to some events that have happened in your life that really shaped what you're doing now to help other people. Sure. And I have to tell you, I'd love to keep the DeLorean if I could. <laughs> Wouldn't we um, all? Wouldn't we all? So, I've got three Lego versions, but that's yeah, as close cool as I've got. <laughs> Yeah, well, cool, cool car, cool movies when I think of the Back to the Future movies. Um, so, yes. Um, so, first of all, very little of my life was my plan. My plan, I was a bit of a troublemaker when I was a kid, and I <laughs> didn't go to school very much. Um, I had a big mouth, and I talked back to my teachers, Ooh. and I more or less stopped going to school when I was at somewhere around eighth or ninth grade, middle school. Mm. Um, I really didn't go to school. I was in uh, fraternities, which were more or less gangs, high school fraternities, which were more or less gangs. And that's what I did. I was out, you know, drinking and doing drugs and such when I was a teenager and causing trouble for my parents and for my teachers and so forth. Um, so first of all, I didn't really get an education. Mm. Um, and where I got my education by, I love to read. Mm. Um, I fell in love with reading books when I was a teenager. Uh, I read a lot of science fiction. Um, Star Wars like or Star Arthur Trek? Which C. one? Clark. I, I was more of a Star Trek guy. I'm okay. married to a Star Wars uh person my wife loves star wars but i'm <laughs> so you've redeemed star yourself guy and i love <laughs> and I, I really <laughs> that's true and in a lot of ways i've redeemed myself with my marriage but i'll get to that um i i really loved reading sci-fi books 
Mm. And I fell in love with the uh, wonderful lyrical writing of Ray Bradbury, who wrote a lot of short stories. Um, he wrote Fahrenheit 451, um, which I didn't read back then. I read it mostly as short stories, but I loved the way he wrote. He wrote in a way that fired my imagination. And um, I read Heinlein. I read Dune. Um, I loved the Dune books. I, lo- I liked the new Dune movie, as a matter of fact, also. Mm. Um, and that's how I got my education, by reading. I love to read. And reading took me away from the troubles that I had. I grew up around violence, around abuse. Um, you know, it, I, I was not a happy kid. Uh, you know, I was, my plan for life was to get as high as I could, as often as I could. That's pretty much what I lived by. And, um, and I lived, that was my dream. That was my dream life. And I kind of did live my dream life for many years. I would say I was high from the early seventies to the early nineties. Wow. You know, uh, I was, uh, a teenager in the seventies. And um, I did like the music of that time. I'm also a musician, and I play uh, a lot of that music professionally for, for, from the uh, early 70s, including er- m- earlier music and later music as well. But I particularly love the music of the 70s. Anyway, um, so the first of the things that you mentioned, the real um, bedevilments, I could call them, that, that affected my life was drug addiction. You know, I liked being high all the time. And I was one of these people that had to stop doing everything mm. um, because I would have just kept doing everything. I, I I would have just kept doing all the different drugs and drinking and so forth uh, if I didn't stop. And I had to have some bad things happen in order for me to stop, mm. you know. And for me, the worst thing that ever happened to me, I would say, is... In 1991, um, my I had a uh, my first child was born in 1990. Mm-hmm. Uh, my son Michael, who is uh, 32 now, um, but when he was one year old, I was taking care of him one day, mm-hmm. and I was high. I had had a few. Oh wow! And he got hurt. Oh, and I became absolutely willing to do anything to change. Because mm-hmm. I adored my son, yeah, and um, and ultimately I did change. You know, I'm one of these guys who had to get some help and had to uh, find some kind of spirituality to help me change, and that's what I did. And I've been clean and sober now for uh, 29 plus years, and and that's probably the first thing that I talk about that can be of help to people. Not everybody has to stop drinking and and doing drugs and so forth. Some people can do a little bit of that stuff and and stop and and they're fine. I'm Mm -hmm. not one of those people. I'm someone who, oh, my life went out here. Uh, I'm one of these people who had to uh, stop doing everything. And stopping connected me to uh, spirituality. And spirituality has been a really great thing in in my life. Um, So that's the first thing. Um, along the way, I fell in love with other authors, uh, with the work of other authors, particularly John Steinbeck. I loved his book, East of Eden, which is probably to this day, if I have a single favorite book, that's the book, uh, mm. East of Eden. And I loved his writing. And right around then, I'd say college age or thereabouts, I decided I want to become a, I wanted to become a writer. And I started to write short stories at the time. And um, I did a lot of writing in college, too. I, I, uh, yeah. um, I, I was a history major and a political science major. And I wrote a lot about, I, for me, history is stories. Yeah. And being a history major, I got to write a lot of stories, which were history-related papers. So, um, so that was kind of fun for me. Um, I didn't I didn't really think of college as fun other than, uh, you know, I uh, I was doing a lot of partying when I was in college. I was uh, (laughs) involved with the rugby club and uh, I played about this much rugby. I played very little rugby, a little bit, but not very much at all. It wasn't something I was great at, um, but I liked the parties and Mm. uh, I liked girls. And um, 
ultimately through that crowd of people, I would eventually in 1985 meet my wife, meet the girl who who I would marry, mm -hmm. uh, who I met at one of those folks that I knew from school, got married and she had a huge wedding. And I asked one of the bridesmaids to dance and I started talking to her and uh, we're married today. We're, we're together 38 years and we're married 36 years and she's the love of my life. I'm really, I'm very blessed in my marriage. Um, that's, I think one of the things that can be helpful to people is to be, is to count your blessings. It might sound silly, it might sound trite, but if you stop to think about the things you have, you know, we take a lot for granted. I mean, look, every now and then, I used to do it every day. I don't do it every day now, but I do stop and count my blessings. And I start with very simple things like I can walk, I can mm. see, I can hear. I can read and write. I can type. I can use a typewriter. I can play piano pretty well, and I, and I get paid to do that. Um, I have enough food to eat. I have a, a refrigerator with food in it. I have a roof over my head. I have clothing. Um, now, that's pretty basic stuff, but it's pretty important stuff, and, and I think we don't always, you know, as life goes on, I, I typically don't stop and think like, wow, I can walk, I can see, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you run into people during your life who can't walk or can't see, and mm -hmm. then then you might think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I had some of my health challenges. I couldn't walk. I had two hip replacements, and before both of them, I couldn't walk. Yeah, uh, I was in terrible pain. And um, that's another thing. I'm not in pain today. It's a good thing. To find the, um, from that perspective, I mean, you talked about the drug component, you know, you were taking drugs, you spent a lot of time getting high. Um, and that transition from, you know, obviously you were still getting high when you got married because you are, you know, you had that happen when you were, right. um, when you were, you know, when or the, you, you had to, you were high when you had the, the incident with your child at one year old. That's right. Yes. How did, um, from that perspective, how would you describe your relationship with your wife now after stopping getting high all the time to when you were actually high on the time? What was your relationship like between the two, those two phases of your life? Well, it, it was good at both points, uh, but mm -hmm. I would have to say it's much more honest now. Mm -hmm. um, I was really okay. in what yeah, way? I, I was. I was doing a lot of sneaking around. I was hiding the fact that I was getting high all the time. I wasn't getting high in front of her. I was wow. now and then, but not all the time. I mean, for me, doing mm -hmm. drugs was like breathing. I had to do it. Yeah. I had to be high. I, you know, I was copping, which is buying drugs. I was copping to get high, to cop, to get high, to cop, to get high. And that's how was, my whole life was. I was either buying drugs or using them. Mm. And I was hiding a lot of that from her. Now, I was very functional. I, I worked at a job at that time. I worked for the ad industry, and I've had a company that does advertising. Um, you probably need to be hired to do that job. So, <laughs> Well, actually, if you guys, I don't know if the American TV show Mad Men is, uh, can be seen yeah, over there. It's very popular, but, yes. Yeah, well, um, in that show... It's at, it's the ad industry, and people are having liquid lunches. They're going drinking all the time. They're drinking mm. on their lunch, lunch breaks, and that's what we did. You know, I I did work. We we put together ads. We did the production, the advertising production of the ads for some very big big companies, very major uh, mm. fashion companies, major automotive companies, Fortune one hundred companies, and. They were fine with you being as high as can be, as long as you could do your job, mm. as long as you could function. And we all, it, we, it was a game. How high could you be and still do your job? Pretty high. Well, I understand high. from that component too, when you're in that space, and I, I've worked in a similar, I've worked in a small advertising company when I was younger. Um, but also when you're in that creative space, because I've worked in film and television as well, it becomes challenging especially if you've got to produce because it's high pressure it's mat people i don't think a lot of people understand unless you've worked in the industry how much pressure is there to deliver a result especially if you're working in something like comedy because you know if it's not funny it's not funny um and you need to be in a right frame of mind to do that how much of that was an impact for you to actually 
needing to be in that right frame of right mind to produce or was it just something that you just needed to do? No, it, that didn't really apply at all because I wasn't creating the ads. I wasn't doing the creative okay. part. Yeah. Of it. I was doing actual production and it was something that I could completely shut off my mind and do. Mm. Um, in fact, I back then we had um, very early... Um, I, I we had little mini cassette players with earphones with with mm -hmm. headphones earphones and my light is just acting up I'm sorry about that um and I used to listen to rock and roll tapes on headphones and it, they just would leave me alone and I would do the production I'd be putting together physical ads mm -hmm. um actually on a computer and I knew how to do it I was very good at it and if you just left me alone, I would do my work where when I got when I would get interrupted and, and what would bother me would be if the foreman or the manager would come in and, and try to talk to me or, you know, I didn't want to be bothered. Yeah. But now I worked for the most part. I worked at night. Mm. I worked late at night, second shift, third shift. And everybody was drinking. I mean, <sighs> I, I'd be at the bar. I'd be at the bar, I'd be at O'Reilly's if I didn't have money, and I'd be at Keen's Chop House if I did have money. <laughs> and I'd, I'd be drinking Guinnesses and Scotches. And I did, I remember that one night I was with a whole bunch of these guys uh, from our shift. We had all gone out in the middle of the shift, and there was a tap on my shoulder, and I turned. It's the owner of the company. Mm -hmm. and he says, I'm buying the next round. And that's how it was, you know, you just drank. And sometimes if you needed to stay there late, there'd be cocaine and you'd have to, you'd be able to work a little bit extra, you know, with a little bit of help. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. It was very crazy. But, you know, you asked earlier about my uh, my wife. So um, I got clean and sober. Probably I was about seven or eight years married already. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you do when you... Um, get involved in some of the programs where you stop drugs and alcohol. Um, I'm not really going to talk about those programs because it's kind of something I'm not supposed to do. Um, but in, in a more general sense, you do this thing when you make amends to people that you've hurt. Mm. And I was, I remember being at that stage was I, where I was doing that. I was making amends to people. And my wife came to me and she said, I understand you're doing this thing where you're making amends to people. And I said, yeah, I am. And she said, where am I on that list? <laughs> I was writing for that. <laughs> and I had to um, keep my mouth shut. Mm -hmm. That was a and good effort. It was a good effort, and but I did, and mm -hmm. and listen to her tell me how much I hurt her and how Ooh. much I treated her badly. How did that um, feel? Painful, very painful, yeah. and very humiliating. And um, mm. the main thing she told me was that when our first son, the one I, I referenced earlier, um, Michael, when he was a, about the age that I was talking about earlier, when he was about a year old or younger even, he didn't mm. sleep. He was colicky. He didn't sleep at all. Mm. I mean, it seemed like, he, I guess he did sleep, but he he. it didn't seem that he slept at all. And apparently she said, I used to scream at her, shut that kid up. I would just scream. And she said that, told me that was like a dagger in her heart. Mm. And she told me that. And I started to cry because I know wow. I love my wife. I didn't want to hurt my wife, but I did because I was an, um, I was someone who would lash out and I, I, I was someone who I had a temper um, mm. and I didn't deal with, I didn't deal with surprises. Well, I didn't deal with change. Well, mm. um, but here I am still married. And the thing that I had to do was change. I had to change and I've changed. I can't, I can't, I can tell you that I still have a temper and I still do things wrong I still make mistakes, but I'm a lot more willing to admit them than I used to be. Interesting that you went through that process because I've worked with a number of people who've gone to various organizations such as AA, those kind of things. Um, yeah. And I've been to many of those meetings with the people you know, in support. Um, and I can relate to that as well. And, and I do wonder when I look at my history, because I used to drink a lot, but I could always stop. 
Um, and I never, you know, it was, it was never something that I had to do. It was something that I wanted to do. And so when I didn't want to do it, I just stopped. Um, but, I, you know, it was, you know, whether that was an addiction or not, I, I, I don't know. And um, then from my perspective, I was in a long-term relationship with someone um, and she had what I thought was a problem. So I thought, okay, I'm going to just stop drinking and hopefully she will follow. Unfortunately, she didn't. But, um, you know, from my perspective, the, the period went for a long, a long period of time where I didn't have anything at all. Um, and then I went, I don't really need this. Um, and it's interesting how it does change the perspective on life when you you actually look at that. I have a friend in Texas who um, did some heavy drugs and he says now he gets much bigger high from helping people. He gets the giver's high and there's no downer from that. What's your your experience from that perspective of, you know, now, because you obviously doing a lot to help people, you, you're, you know, you're sharing this, you know, your stories about love, transcendence and hope. What does that feel like now compared to when you were, were high? So it would never have occurred to me to do any of these things back then. Mm. I would never have thought about being helpful to people. And quite frankly, and you know, my plan, like I said, was to be as high as I could, as often as I could. And I did do that. Mm. But I had no idea about getting married. I had no ideas about having children. It would never, and we never talked about having kids either. It was only someone young, someone in our family who was young died. And my wife and I just kind of looked at each other and said, let's have kids. Life is too short. Mm -hmm. um, but you asked about helping people. So first of all, in order to, so one of the things they say in some of these organizations, uh, such as AA and other 12-step programs is in order to keep it, you have to give it away. You know, mm -hmm. the thing, the guys who started AA, especially Bill Wilson, uh, who, mm -hmm. who really was the one of the two founding members of AA, found that. He didn't drink when he helped other other alcoholics. And he went around looking. He went to hospitals saying, you got any real low bottom drunks? I got to talk to him. And and I think they thought he was a little crazy. But <laughs> he went around helping people. And he said, I don't know if, how much I'm helping them, but it's helping me. Because when I help them, I don't drink. So I've done a lot of service work. That's what mm -hmm. they call it. Um, I've done a lot. You know, I'm in my 30th year of being clean and sober mm -hmm. and i've done a lot of service work i've helped a lot of people some of them were helped some of them stay i don't know if it was because of me but they i mean it really is because of them there's only one requirement for those things is you got to want to stop mm -hmm. um and they wanted to stop and so i could be of service because they wanted to stop mm -hmm. um so it feels good it feels good to know that you've been of a little help. I mean, there have been other people that I tried to help who've died. Mm. You know, I, I was trying to help a young kid who was my son, Dan, I, my younger son's age. My son, Dan, is 29 now, but it was um, nine or 10 years ago. This kid was 21 or something like that. And um, he went out, bought a bag of dope, shot it and died. Mm. And uh, it was heartbreaking. And I've seen a lot... You go to, you know, you go to the drug programs and you see a lot of kids die. Mm. And I've seen a lot of that. I've seen a lot of kids die and it's heartbreaking. But you see all the people who make it and it's just the before and there's nothing like the before and after pictures. You see people who come in and they're devastated and they're terrified and they're trying to act cool. And, <laughs> and yes, and, but they're falling apart. A lot of bravado. They, yeah. Yeah, the bravado. And sometimes there's not even that, but yeah, right. But mm. then you see them a few months later, and they're just different people. And you go and you see their parents, or their parents come to celebrate their anniversaries with them. It's just magnificent. Mm. It's just the people who get helped. It's just wonderful, you know. And I just need to say that having gone through a lot of this stuff later, when I found myself in hospitals about to get sliced open and sliced up. Um, you know, it was scary, but I had had spiritual experience and I'd come to believe in something. I mean, I, I, I was about to be paralyzed. I couldn't play piano. I was playing piano. I had been playing piano at a steak and sushi place out on Long Island. And um, every Saturday, 
and I was finding I couldn't play piano any, anymore. My my hands weren't working right, and I was mm. stumbling and I walked like I was drunk, but I wasn't drunk. I didn't drink. And uh, this was maybe four years ago, three years ago, twenty twenty one, and um, two years ago. And uh, um, I was stumbling when I walked, and I called this hospital in New York City that's known to be one of the best hospitals, at least in the country, if not the world. And I talked to a surgeon and, you know, he said, come in and see me. And I, I saw him and he said, you need spine surgery right away or you're going to be paralyzed. Mm -hmm. and what was that like when they told you that? <laughs> it was scary. My, I had, I was, uh, when I was driving there, I, I was on the phone with my wife and I had just had a, a hip replacement and a double hernia the previous year. And my wife said, do me a favor, don't make any appointments for surgeries, please. And I said, listen, if this surgeon tells me, honey, that, that this is progressive, it's getting worse and it needs surgery, I'm going to do it. Mm. And that's just what happened. I'm sitting with this guy's that name is Dr. James Farmer at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I'm very blessed. You know, I have all these problems, but I'm blessed to be in a country where there's great health care. I have access to that care. So that's how I see it. I have these problems, but I'm in a place where there is all these solutions. I'm not in Ukraine. You know, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm in New York City. I'm just outside mm -hmm. of New York City. And he said, yeah, you, you, you need this and you need it right away or you're going to be paralyzed. So I had the surgery and it was successful. I have a little tingling in my hands. But three days later, I got violently ill, like mm. you're, you're probably too young for this, but exorcist ill, like puking for distance ill. And and um, I went to the the emergency room. And they said, we're going to run some tests. And they came back with the test. They said, you got a problem. You have air in your intestines. And I said, wait a minute. You just did cervical spine. I just had, not by them, but I, I just had surgery on my neck. How is it possible that my intestines have a problem three mm -hmm. days later? And they said it has nothing to do with it. Complete coincidence. Wow. And and they How said, did you well, keep your faith with that? I mean, because you've obviously got a strong faith. I mean, from that I'm about perspective. To tell you. Oh, okay. I'm about to tell you. Yeah, it's exactly where I'm going. You, 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 you're anticipating my answer. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm connected with you, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So they put me in an ambulance, and these terrific guys are taking me in this ambulance, lights and sirens, going to the, this hospital. I live on a barrier yeah. island. Yeah. If, if the bridge is up, you're going to die because you're not going to get off the island. But, right. but luckily, the bridge wasn't, you know, the, after Hurricane Sandy, we had a hospital here that was destroyed in Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane mm. Sandy here, everything was underwater in my town. My house, I have a beautiful home. It was underwater. Everything oh, was underwater. God. Anyway, um, so they taken me to this hospital. I've just had my spine fused and I've got, you know, metal bolts in my neck. And I'm on my way to this hospital. And all I could think in the ambulance was surrender, surrender, surrender. God's taking care of this. I, I'm not going to tell you I had faith that I was going to be okay. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that I'm just handing this whole thing over to God. And whatever's going to happen, I'm go, I'm going to go along for the ride. I'm still terrified, you know, through all, a lot of these things. I'm real scared. But... I just, there was a piece about me that I just was, I, it's something that we say in recovery, surrender to win, mm. surrender to go over to the winning side, you know, mm. surrender is a good thing when it comes to drug addiction, because you, you, if you keep fighting to defeat the drugs, you're not going to win, you have to surrender to something better. So anyway, I'm thinking surrender, surrender, surrender. So I, it's I'm exhausting too, when you're fighting it. I mean, we know that from a, if you That's look right. at a physical war, it's, it's exhausting, and then no one wins it. We can see that currently, you mentioned right. Ukraine, and you can currently see that neither side is going to win that um, at the ultimate outcome. Um, you know, and and that surrendering and going, okay, let's, let's, let's accept where we're at is is very powerful. Acceptance is much more relaxing than than being at war. The war's over. And, you know, people I know in recovery say the war's over. I lost. You know, mm. and, and so <laughs> well, I found myself. Did they lose? Well, they might have. Could... They might have lost the component of them that was fighting. But you're right. Yeah, you go over to the winning side when you surrender. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And so, but I stopped fighting. I found myself, I had to wait in this hospital waiting. It was, I was in my own room on mm. a bed, but I'm, you know, I had to wait for there to be, to be a surgeon. I didn't know what was going to happen. I just knew I had air in my intestines and that the, they threw me in this ambulance be, because mm. that's what they said. That's what they did. I didn't know. I didn't know what was coming next. So, but I'm thinking surrender to surrender, surrender. And after 10 hours, this Haitian, this wonderful Haitian doctor comes in and he says, well, we're going to take good care of you. But first, you got to explain about these tattoos. I have a lot of tattoos. So so he was joking around. He says, but seriously, I have to cut a piece out of your, your lower intestine. You might wake up with a bad. I said, wait, what? What? He says, you might wake up with a colostomy bag. Mm. I, I, and I just was like, oh, my God. Oh, yeah. my God. And that's just what happened. I woke up and I had a bag and I had to live with the bag, the colostomy bag. Um, they reroute your butt out your stomach. So you're pooping mm. out your stomach. And uh, I lived like that for three months. And thank goodness they could fix it. I mean, listen, there's a lot of people. And as I realized since then, people I know actually mm who live permanently with those bags. Mm. And um, so I learned to live that way. And that's just what I did for the next three months. And they reversed it in uh, um, January of 2021. I might be getting Describe, my again, get, can you go into a little bit more detail about that faith, about where that that trigger became to say hey, surrender? What, how, did you, how did you just let go and surrender? It wasn't a process. So so how I let go of surrender is that that was two years ago. So for 27 years before that, I had been practicing mm. surrender already. I had been, you know, you get to Carnegie Hall or whatever the great hall is over there to, to play in, in Melbourne or whatever. Sydney Opera it is. House. <laughs> Sydney Opera House. Yeah, you're playing at Sydney yeah. Opera House. And someone says, well, how did you get to be this good? And you, you, they, they didn't start that day. You know, yeah. they started a long time before. So I had been, you know, I, I had failed at giving up drugs mm. for many, many years. I threw away a lot of bags of drugs. And a day or two later, I was always looking for them. Mm. You know, well, I got involved in a program where you learn how to surrender mm. and you practice on in all sorts of things. I mean, I, I don't like. I don't like um, not knowing what's going to happen. I'm a control freak. I want to know what ha is going to happen every few minutes. But and even like with this interview, how does that I, work? I, don't know, wait, how how does did, that I mean, work? you're a control freak, but you were taking drugs. That's kind of a juxtaposition there. No, I don't think so at all. I, I, okay. I could control. I could control everything because I was high. So what you did? Well, is that was that a perception? Because your wife had a different story when she talked about how, you know, from what you, if I heard you correctly, your wife told you you thought you were doing one thing. Well, so was it real control or was it perception of control? Of course, it was perception. But but look, you can make an argument that everything is perception. <laughs> You know that oh, yeah. everything is perception. It's the matrix. <laughs> you can make an argument that green is blue. You know, if you yeah. want. But but um, the, the, but from my point of view, I wanted to control circumstances as they unfolded in front of me. I wanted to control mm. the future. But if I was high all the time, whatever happened next. If you know, my mother yelled at me, or if the teacher wasn't happy that I didn't have my homework, I didn't care. I was high. Well, that's okay. that's the point I wanted to get to. What was it that, and I think you just answered that question because I was going to ask why, what was this need that you had to be high all the time? So what were you escaping? Reality. Reality. But why? Was, well, what was the reason for escaping reality? What What didn't you like about it that you needed to escape? Was that linked back to the violence at the start? What? Maybe, maybe. I, I, I mean, look, you could, whether or not some people believe that being an addict is an accident of birth or that it's genetics. There certainly is our predispositions uh, when it comes to alcoholism. Mm. If, if your father or your grandfather is an alcoholic or all your uncles are alcoholics, there is a fair chance that you might be. 
Um, I don't know how that is, if that's the case with all of addiction, but there is a propensity towards addiction from, you know, that comes from genetics. Well, that's, um, there was I also, mean, part of well, it. Hang on. Let me just, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Let me yeah. just go on. Uh, yeah. there, there was also, uh, I found life to be very painful. Mm. Um, and some of that was that there was violence and there was trauma and there was mm. PTSD, which I still have, um, uh. you know, and, and. There was also that I had, uh, I think I was born with a pretty severe anxiety. Um, we have people with severe depression in my in my uh, genetics, in mm. my family. We have four suicides in my family. My mm. great grandmother killed herself in front of the whole family. Um, wow. it was before it was around, but my mother was a child and she was there and she won the argument. She had an argument with someone in the family. She said, oh, yeah. And she went up to the top of the house and she jumped off. She won the argument. You know, uh, I wow. had a first cousin who did the same thing. I have two wow. cousins who were, I think, were brothers and both killed themselves. Um, so we have a fair amount of, of depression in our family. So some of it was that I had anxiety and I had clinical issues, mental health issues, um, which I didn't think I needed treatment for until, you know, I, in my uh, in the show notes that you have. Um, I talk about depression. Well, in 2005, I, I never thought much about depression. I have someone in my family who mm -hmm. I'm very close to who has long had depression, who has been incapacitated, unable to work for 30 years. And I would say to her, come on, look around. Everything's fine. And and then in 2005, I got very sick with the same mm -hmm. thing. And I kind of went, oh, because unless you've had it, you don't know. Mm. You know, it's like imagine having like you feel like there's a bear chasing you all the time mm. all the time and you're like ah, all the time yeah and I, I had to sit in a dark room with silence for a month really oh it was terrible it was, it was worse than all the other stuff and then I, I didn't get to the part where i had cancer last year i had cancer i was supposed to have a, a, another hip replacement and they said no you can't have your hip replaced you have cancer you can't have any surgeries until the cancer is fixed so but 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 the depression was worse than all of this stuff worse than having my intestines cut up the depression was the worst thing because you feel like there's a bear chasing you and it's not going to ever stop so how did, awful. from that perspective, the depression side of things, how did that, I mean, as you said, you were telling people, you know, focus on the good stuff. Um, and then all of a sudden you found yourself having depression. How did that play out? How did, what was the road to that leading to the depression, do you think? Well, we had a big family fight. I had a big fight with some people in my family. Mm -hmm. I had a big fight with, uh, excuse me, with my mother. Right. I don't know what it was about. It was, I think it was probably about our childhoods or my childhood. Uh, and we would have fights about these things every now and then. We would have disagreements. And sometime after this, I just stopped. The, the symptom that I had was I stopped sleeping and I really stopped sleeping. And I don't, you know, right. insomnia when it's really, really bad, is just mm. awful. When you can't mm. sleep after, not the, so much the first or the second night, but when you get into the fifth night or the sixth night, and you're really not sleeping at all. Mm. I mean, at all. It was just awful. And mm. I was having terror. It was just, it was just terrible. I don't wish it on anyone. But what I came to understand, I was not a big fan of medication. I, I you know, I was like, well, you know, go to recovery, go to, you know, do meditate, you know, but what I came to understand, and I have a, um, I have a book about Buddhism. That's an interesting take on this sort of thing. But mm. what I came to realize to cut the, to the chase is that I needed to see doctors. Yeah. I needed to see doctors and I saw doctors and it took a little while, but the doctors helped, but I also did my own stuff. I also got involved in my, um, I was spending time while I was sick, I was spending time with a bunch of older guys who were in recovery. There were older guys in AA and, and they really hanging out with these guys really helped me. They were very positive. And eventually I, someone suggested that I go back to my religion. I never, I wasn't raised with any religion, really. I'm Jewish by birth, but I wasn't raised to participate in that. My parents weren't interested in that. They didn't, they thought the whole notion of God was just silly. And, um, 
you know, to get clean and sober, you kind of have to become to believe in something as part of the program. Um, and I, how do you do that? Well, you practice, you act as if you have that in your life and you practice mm. it. And that's what I did. And eventually I went and got involved in my own religion and I found the regular prayers and the melodies and the songs and all of that to be very lovely and very sweet. Mm -hmm. And whether you believed it or not, it was very nice. There were, you know, listen, I'm married to a scientist. My wife is a scientist. She's an environmental scientist and she believes in God. You think of scientists as people who don't believe in God. My wife is a scientist. She believes in God. Not only that, but she thinks nature, science, nature is evidence of God. Mm. So um, I, I did go back and get involved in my uh, religion, and I still mm. participate in that. I play piano at a synagogue sometimes, and it's lovely. It's delightful. From that perspective, you mentioned at the very start, you talked about how you're you're grateful for what you have. You're, you're counting your blessings, you know, even just the fact that you're breathing, that you're walking, that you can do that. And and you've obviously got that perspective given that you haven't. And sometimes it takes that to realize that those things, are, they could be taken away quite easily. And then you talk about, you just talked about then about, you know, the prayer and the and the songs and things like that, which is a, is a repetitive, um, you know, repetitive information put it that way how much of that do you think is linked to where you are now i mean yes there's there's a genetic component that you might that you talked about that's that's possible um and there's a lot of this stuff that research is still a long way from concluding where things are at but from that perspective if you were to look at your earlier life when you needed to get high because you wanted to it sounds like you wanted to escape to now when you've gone through this process of you're constantly reminding yourself of what you're grateful for. You've also going through again, attending, you know, the, the church that you're attending and, and repeating prayers and things like that. How much of that do you think changed your perspective on life and, and how you approach life? I think it's, it's a, um, I want to say a double-edged sword, but that sounds like a negative. It, it's, I think it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. Um, in that my life made these things necessary. Mm -hmm. Um, I needed to find some kind of solution. Uh, you know, I, I had a, uh, a hole, I mean, a hole in my heart that I was trying to fill mm -hmm. that I, I felt like there was a lack, you know, and mm -hmm. I filled it with drugs and I filled it with, um, you know, acting like a tough guy. Yeah. You know, um, and today I I do think that whether it's prayers and different kind of spiritual connections and recovery and gratitude, I think these things are very much the answer to what I was looking for growing up. I was also looking for a sense of belonging. You know, I mean, you know, I was I was reading recently and, you know, I write crime fiction. I write mysteries and um, I've read in mysteries and I've read in the news also that people who are in gangs, really, really violent gangs, mm. frequently join those gangs because they want to belong to something because they haven't had healthy families to belong to. And the gangs yeah. provide them with a family of sorts. Well, that's yeah. what I found. I found that mm. with. Some of the uh, people that I use drugs with and people in who are in the gangs that I ran around with. And today I find it uh, with sober people and uh, um, in various kinds of recovery. And I find it with spiritual people. I find it with musicians. I'm a performing musician. I, I play piano for seniors in um, old old folks homes, nursing mm. homes. Um, I have an act that I've two acts that I'm in a rock and roll band and I'm in a duo that performs music from the sixties for audiences at libraries and restaurants and so forth. I find it in music. I think that there's a lot of great stuff in life. Um, and gratitude as I started off with is, is really important. You know, one of the first people I met in recovery used to say, it's not about having what you want. It's about wanting what you have. Yeah. And gratitude, Love that's that what comment. gratitude is all about. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, it's it's a look at what I have. And and when you stop to look around, we're very rich people. And for me, again, all of these health 
challenges I've had, I've also had answers, health answers for all mm. of them. From that, pers- so like, from that perspective of where you, because I wonder about this a lot, you were looking for a connection and, and I wondered about that when you talked about the sci-fi books that you read and that you loved and it was, and I, and, and as a form of escape, and I can relate to that. I, I, you know, there was a number of books that I read as a um, young adult, which were my escape as well. So I, I understand that component. How much of that do you put down to what you're going through now comes back to, to actively listening to alternatives that are out there? Cause when you were younger, I'm imagining that, you know, you had a set way of dealing with things and you just want to escape. And that was the only alternative. But then you found recovery, which gave you another alternative. And then you started to listen to that. How much of that transition do you think happens when we actually truly listen to what's going on around it and accept that there is an alternative? Well, it depends. I I, I listen much more closely when I'm in pain. When, when I have a particular need, I'm a big belief. And I never would have said this earlier in life. I didn't believe in God early in life. <clears throat> it's not that I didn't believe in God. I, it wasn't on my radar at all. I didn't mm-hmm. think about it. No one ever brought it up. I thought going to church was for sissy sort of, you know, because I'd be out with the boys drinking under the train tracks and throwing bottles at trains and things like that. Um I, I grew up Catholic. I'm I'm actually Polish, Russian, and Ukrainian all combined, um, but mostly oh, wow. Polish. Um, and and to to call it the um, the Catholic and the the history with the, the the different wars that they started sissies is probably a stretch <laughs> when you look at it from that perspective. I, and I relate because I've done similar things to what you did when you were younger as well. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but from I don't that. Really know- Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, from that perspective, and you said, because one of my business partners, she said to me, for me, I found this really profound. She said, you learn through pain until you learn to learn through joy. And I just wonder, and that's why I come back to that listening component, is it that pain that forces us to say, hang on a minute, um, I need to stop being so arrogant that this is my perception of the world, is the perception of the world. Maybe there's a broader thing here. And it's that pain that wakes us up to look beyond what we believe the world to be well going around thinking i knew everything was Mm. all well and good but when you come down say with cancer it doesn't serve you so much you know (laughs) um i i was what i was going to say before is that i would never have believed in prayer i thought prayer was just a silly idea Mm. and i've become a big believer in prayer and just to to link it to what you were talking about um i think that being in pain and praying for guidance and comfort, which is really, those are the two things that I pray for is guidance and comfort, um, is not, it is it is not just coming from a place of pain, it's coming from a pl- place of joy also. Mm. Um, I, I would say I walk around with a fair amount of joy today. I have a nice backyard where I get to listen to the birds, I, you know, and I get to look at the butterflies and yeah. I have a little dog that comes out there with me who runs around and wants to play and stuff like that. And mm. I, I really do enjoy those things. And I enjoy much more of life. And I walk around much less tyrannized by my thoughts and my ideas and by thinking you know, what's that guy in the next car? Why is he looking at me? Well, maybe he's looking at the sunsets that's on the other <laughs> side of my car. You know, he might well, not be looking at me at all. That's the part that I'm getting to. What mm-hmm. What is that, you know, is it this perception that we have? I remember when I was in Perth, I lived in Perth and my girlfriend lived up north. And there's a beautiful road that goes, you know, north to south in, in Perth along the coast. I mean, I lived on the coast and she lived on the coast. And, and But the thing was, there's a lot of traffic lights on that road. Um, and I would get frustrated because I'm obviously going to see my girlfriend. I'm excited. Um, and every red light I got, I'm like, I'm always getting the red lights, always getting the red lights. But being angry retentive, one day I decided I'm going to start counting them. And I had a little notepad next to me and I ticked, which were the, every time I got a green light and every time I got a red light. The reality was I had so many more green lights. I just never noticed them. And I'm wondering from that perspective, when you compare your life earlier, 
to what it is now, were the opportunities and all those things there, but this is where I'm coming back to that listening component, openly listening, going, hey, um, I was just focused on this little segment of the world and seeing what I wanted to see rather than the broader picture. Absolutely. Absolutely. There were tons of opportunities in my life growing up and I didn't see them. And the problem absolutely was me. Mm. The problem was me and that I was dissatisfied and I was, um, I mean, I think I was clinically very anxiety ridden and possibly depressed and they didn't know that then, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't all the information about that stuff then that there is now. And I missed a great deal of the forest for the trees. Uh, I, I, you know, my father was a fine, fine musician and my parents were good people. Um, And I lived, you know, my brother and sister remember a happy childhood and the people in my neighborhood remember a happy neighborhood. I remember a war zone. Yeah. And that has a lot to do with me. Well, that's what I was Absolutely. wondering about from that perspective. When and when then when you link it to anxiety, like you said, how much of that anxiety do you think was caused by your focus on those red lights, so to speak? Some of it. Some of it. I think it's very hard to separate out and say, well, mm-hmm. this percentage percentage of it is anxiety. This percentage of it is you know bad stuff that happened in kindergarten or or, or you know. Mm. I, I think it's very hard to separate things out. You know, I mean, yeah. we are this greater than the sum or maybe less than the sum of our parts. And we're complicated beings and life is complicated. <laughs> yes. um, there was also the times. I mean, I was growing up, you know, pre-Watergate uh, during the 60s. There was a lot of turmoil in America. There was mm. a lot of um, polarization in politics, although I suspect it's probably <laughs> worse <was> now. <laughs> But it was bad then, too. Yeah. And it, you know, there was, you know, the, the 60s, children of the 60s and all that wonderful music. But there was a lot of uh, also social unrest at the time. So and I grew up in a house. My parents were social activists and we grew up mm. very aware of how bad people had it. People of color or people who were less fortunate than us. Mm. You know, we had very good values as a family, but I definitely missed a lot of the opportunities. And it was because I was pretty messed up. Mm. And so from that perspective, you've gone through and, and now you've you've found a recovery program, you've been working through that. What was the motivation to start writing? Well, I'd always wanted to start writing. I, I had wanted okay. to start writing because that's how I got my education was by reading. I yeah. love to read and I love to create. And I wrote short stories when I was oh, probably in my early, oh, mid-20s maybe I started writing short stories and um, I always wrote well I wrote well in college I did well on my papers Um, Mm -hmm. and I somewhere in there oh I know what happened my uncle had an experience during World War II my uncle was in the Flying Tigers during World War II and he was in China and he had kind of a crazy experience where he and a bunch of other American soldiers met kids who lived near their army base in Kunming, China, who were all members of the Communist Party, Mm. these kids. And they were like 20 years old, 18 years old. And they became friends with these soldiers. And the soldiers were very leftist. They were very uh, liberal, even radical. My uncle, too. And it's a very long story, which I'm not going to get into. But he, through these kids, he met Chairman Mao. Oh, wow. And... He came to me and when, and when I was a senior in when I was a freshman in college, he took out this picture of him and Chairman Mao and said, I'm going to go back to China. And this was in 1970 something. And nobody went to China then. Nobody. Mm. Um, Mao was still alive. And I said, I want to go. And I went. He went back to China and he tried to go to China and he he applied for a visa and they said, forget it. No, you can't go to China. And he sent the picture and they rolled out the red carpets and he Mm -hmm. went to China and I went to China. Anyway, the reason I brought that up is he asked me to write his story in a book Mm -hmm. and he knew I wanted to be a writer. And that was the link to my writing of today is I wrote his story in a book and I was all set to sell it to a university press who eventually I did sell a book to, but one of the guys, one of the Chinese guys in the story read my manuscript 
which was a, a factual account of what happened. And he said, you can't write this book because I'll be shot. Because I wrote all about the Communist Party in China at that time. And I, mm. you can't do that. And he said, I'll be shot. My family will be shot. You can't, you can't. And so I fictionalized it. And the publisher said, well, it's not the true story, so I'm not going to publish it. But I now I knew the publisher and I sold him another book uh, a few uh -huh. years later, but also about World War II. Long story. I'm not going to get into that. About, about a kid who was Christian, was in the Luftwaffe, mm -hmm. and who today, who eventually moved to Israel and married a Holocaust survivor. Really interesting story. But that got me started on writing. And then I decided to start writing mysteries because I love to read mysteries. And I've written a six book mystery series. Uh, which I'd love to tell you about if there's any time. Yeah, um, no, and that's where I want to head to because, I mean, what, what was the inspiration for writing the mystery books? You've got this six-part series or six-book series of, of mysteries. What right. is it about mysteries? How do you write a mystery book? That's a good question. I, I can't really answer how I write mystery books, but I read a lot of mystery books. It's mm. The same way I loved, I came to want to write was by reading and I've read a lot of mystery books and probably my favorite, if I have, I have many favorites, but one of my favorite series, mystery series, are the Jack Reacher books mm -hmm. uh, by Lee Child, the British author, really Americanized British author, Lee Child. And I read all of his books and I particularly love Jack Reacher because... People get abused in those books. Very often, women get abused or people who are weak get bullied. And those people always get what's coming to them. Mm. Always. And I love that bullies get what's coming to them because I grew up around violence mm. and I grew up around bullies. And so I made my main character, Dora Ellison, could have been a niece of Jack Reacher because people... She runs into someone early in every book who is bullying someone, and she teaches them a lesson. She's a martial arts savant um, who mm -hmm. finds her way into um, being an investigator because she's she's a lesbian woman. Don't ask me why I wrote about two lesbian women. I have no idea. They showed up, and they told me to write about them, and so I did. Um, she is in love with a police detective, a woman, a police mm -hmm. uh, lieutenant. And something happens to that woman while she's investigating a crime. And Dora gets involved and she mm. becomes an investigator to kind of avenge what happens to her lover. And um, Dora is someone who does not tolerate any BS from bullies. And ultimately, early in every book, she runs into a bully. In one case, it's someone who's bullying his dog and she beats the guy up and she takes the dog and she has the dog. And I have dogs in every book, too, because I love dogs. Um, wow. And um, later in every book, she runs into the real bully who's the murderer and um, she teaches them a lesson. I happen to be a big, big martial arts fan, mm. a mixed martial arts fan. I did some martial arts myself at a low level until I got my ribs broken. Um, and I was also a big boxing fan from the early 60s when I saw Muhammad Ali back when he was Cassius Clay uh, fight. And I've been a big fight fan ever since. Uh, by the way, I'm a big um, Alexander Volkanovsky fan, big Volkanovsky fan. Uh, mm. You talk about Aussies. Uh, he's, he's he's one of my favorite Aussies. I, I mean, I don't know a lot of Aussies, but but um, she's a martial arts savant who finds her way to martial arts she tries out at a school yeah. and she mops the floor with everyone except the instructor and she fights the instructor to, to a uh, to a draw and so i've written these these series of mysteries which also have social issues there's racism in many of them mm. there's uh people getting sick in a hospital where someone's going around in a hospital giving everyone the worst diseases known to humankind Wow. Uh, like the flesh eating bacteria, crazy things like that. I have uh, gender issues where someone is killing people who are transgender in one of the books. Mm. And I, I have people with special needs, it's an issue close to my heart. Um, a person who has uh, cerebral palsy, who's a brilliant singer, is murdered while he's singing. Uh, in, in my previous book, um, A Divisive Storm, uh, a special storm. I'm sorry, a special storm. It's about, about people with special needs. And now I have uh, August 1st is the, a divisive storm, which is essentially about uh, bigotry and racism of, in all forms. So it sounds like with the writing of your books, what I'm hearing is that you're want, there's you're wanting to bring awareness to these political or not political, these social issues. 
is that part of what the the motivation for writing is? It is. I'm very, very socially aware. My wife and I both are very socially aware. We both, I mean, I'm not here to talk about politics, but we both have very definite views. Uh, we, we, um, yeah, I have a very strong feelings on a lot of these issues. Um, for instance, the special needs thing, while it's not so much of a social issue, mm -hmm. I have a niece, my brother's daughter, who has special needs, severe special needs, and she she's 24, she's never walked, she's never spoken, and she never will. Wow. And um, she's also the, the most wonderful person I've ever met. She's never hurt anybody. She can laugh all day. She can start laughing and she'll keep laughing all day, shaking her whole body, shaking with laughter yeah. all day. And she's wow. wonderful. But I, I think it's important to bring awareness to these issues. I have bigots in these books. There's there uh, there's a lot of crazy ideas floating around the world. I'm certainly floating around America nowadays. There's QAnon stuff. So I put that in my books. I put people who have some of these ideas in my books and um you know, someone recently pointed out, you know, having um, that stuff in your books and having two gay characters, you might lose readers. Mm -hmm. And my first reaction was to say something not very nice to her. But I realized she's she's right. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, and I want readers. I don't want to lose readers. I want readers who are Republicans. I want readers who are Democrats. I want readers who are, I want readers. Mm -hmm. I want to make my living doing this. So I had to really give that some thought. And I actually am ending my Dora Ellison series after six, well, in, including a prequel, there's seven books, and I'm going to start a different series uh, for that reason. Okay, that's interesting. So from that perspective, it's, isn't it we, we're moving into that world where the, that is more commonplace? I mean, I even look at the recent, um, you, you referenced Star Trek, um, the recent Picard series, you know, the two one some of the two main or well, two of the main don't protagonists. Don't, don't say it. I didn't watch. I didn't watch all it? of it. Oh, I'm don't. watching it, but I didn't. I've only. I'm only in season two. I think. Oh, okay, because there's a where the um. I want the board. There's the there's the where there's a lesbian almost a lesbian relationship in that. Um. Well, it, it is. I never would have dreamed that people would have given me a hard time. I happen to become friendly with someone in recovery who is an author. We've become friendly because we're both authors. And she read my book and she said, wow, you can write, you know, so would you read my book? And we started talking and she happened to be the person who mentioned this, that, you know, I'm reading your book and I am concerned that you might be losing readers because you have two lesbian main, main, she said that it's great to have characters of all genders, all proclivities or whatever, but to have main characters, I don't know. I said, I said, come on, come on, this is 2023. And she said, well, I asked my neighbor and my neighbor said, as soon as I see that they're lesbian, I would put the book down. And my first mm. reaction was to say, oh, to hell with you, you know, but but I didn't say that because I, th I, I thought I got to think about that because I'd like it if my, it's very, I'm an independent author. I publish my own books. I have a company, my my marketing company publishes my books, Eface Media. And mm. I would like to sell more. It's really hard as an independent author. I don't have Random House's money. I don't have mm. Alfred Knopf Penguin Viking Penguin's money. I don't have that kind of money to put behind it, my books. I spend some money marketing them, but I don't have that much. So I can't. I have to eat. I have to pay for my home, you know? Yeah. So what do you do? It's hard. So I, I had to think about what she said, and I decided I don't want to lose readers because my main characters are gay. And why did I do that? I don't know why I did it. That's what showed up. Well, it sounds uh, like if I'm, what I'm hearing from your perspective and, and what you've talked about is that you want to open up thought processes around this. And the question is, how do you do that? And obviously, if if you're, you know, people are immediately going to put down the book, like your neighbor said, then you're not going to be able to have an impact. So I, I understand that motivation. You're going, okay, you want to, you know, look at how you can reach people. If, you know, because it sounds like you want to help and uh, create yeah. awakenings. Yeah. If, look, if someone's just going to see, oh, look, she kissed her. She, I'm, goodbye. I'm putting down the book. What am I going to do? You know, there's only so much I can do about that. But I am, tr I, I am making a point when I approach any of these issues to try to write about them even handedly and not from a particular political point of view. 
I'm mm. really trying to do that. I honestly think that most Americans, Americans, most people, most humans don't care that much whether someone they run into is straight, gay, transgender, what you know, black, white, Asian, Ukraine, Russian. It's it's more what they say and what they do and what their actions are that tell me mm. if I want to be around them. I, I I would agree with that. I've traveled to over 44 countries and the people I found wherever I went were people. They want to enjoy life. They want good things for the kids. Fundamentally, they're all the same. We have difference in think, cultures and things like that, but fundamentally I found we're all the same. I, and I, Yeah, and I, th I think that most people find that even people who say they have a particular agenda, for the most part, if they run into another person, you know, it's interesting. One of the books that I haven't really talked about here is I wrote a book called the neighborhood. And it's about the town I grew up in, Valley Stream, New York, which when I lived there was 100% white, 100% white when I lived there. Actually, there was one black family. in my. There was a one black young man in my high school when I was there. And he did okay, uh, as far as I know. But when I was living there, a black family moved in around the corner and someone burned a cross on their lawn. Mm. Okay. Now, my mother, God bless my mother, she went over to, their, to the house of these new folks in town, this new black family moved in, knocked on their door. And when the woman came to the door, she said, I want you to know, some of us want you here. Mm. My did. Isn't that something? And, um, and so, but here's the thing. When I went to high school, we, um, people used the word that you're not supposed to say, the N word. People mm. used that word all the time when mm -hmm. I was in high school, all the time. And they used words. I, I was around a lot of anti-Semitism. When I was six years old, um, a bunch of teenagers who are gigantic to me, I lived next door to a school. I was in the schoolyard and they came up to me and they said, excuse me, are you Jewish? And I said, yes. And they said, oh, that's very bad. You have to go back in your house and don't come out until you're not Jewish anymore. <laughs> no. Now, well, it's funny, but it wasn't funny because yeah, I didn't. I'm, go I'm to, laughing you know, the ridiculousness well, of it. It's just I didn't like, go to well, but it, to me it was terrifying. I didn't go to yeah. school, you know. Yeah. I didn't want to go to school. So, but here's the thing: people use these words that were the worst words that you could use nowadays. People use them all the time, and yet I have reconnected to a lot of these people because of Facebook. I'm friends with people. I'm 66 years old. I'm friends with people that I knew when I was hmm. five. Right, 60 years ago, um, I'm friends with them now because of Facebook. And I see some of these people who used very bigoted language back then, mm. they have blended families. Their children married people That's of color. That's what I'm laughing at. It's just like, how ridiculous is that? But but change occurs. So, what I, so my book, and I, I hate to be a spoiler alert, but in my book, you know, there is a lot of bigotry in my book. And in my book, what this book is about is – Four families living there at that time, and one of them is the first family of color to move into the neighborhood. And what happens? All hell breaks loose, right? Mm -hmm. But it's actually the black family who makes change because the mother, the grandmother, the matriarch of the family, who is this proud African woman, says, um, we're going to put our best food forward. And her daughter, the mother, says, you mean your best foot forward? That's a saying we have here. Your yes. best foot forward. And she said, no best food forward we're going to have parties and we're going to make all our best food and we're going to invite everyone in the neighborhood to the parties mm -hmm. and that's what they do in the book but what happens eventually over time is what i think happened to these people i see in facebook who have these very colorful families when you're around people who you think are different and you grew up around the dinner table you hear your father talk about these people in very bad language but you grow up and you're around them and you you see them every day you realize they're people. They're yeah. just people. And that's they're just nice. like us. They're not different. They're the same. And that's what happens, I think. You're around people, but you got to give them a chance. I think what, I mean, what you're talking about there too, I mean, and I noticed that from my own travels and you meet people and and one of my business partners, he's, he's from Iran. Um, and I grew up, you know, I, I'm a little bit younger than you, but not by much. Um, but in the 70s where I grew up was, um, you know, there was Iranian 
they blew up planes. That was that's what they did. They hijacked planes and did that. And and now and you know I've got this business partner who's from Iran, and I'm learning all about the Persian culture. And it's like it was so exciting. It was like and and just how much they loved and cared for their families and stuff like that. It was it was rich really, culture. Yeah. It was just just wonderful to hear. And then that's where I, I love what you're doing with your books and um for people that can't travel, that they can get a different perspective on life. That and that that what your stories are about, as you said, love transcendence and hope. Um, I love that mission you're on. Um from that perspective, I mean, we we'll, if we're winding this up. If you were to give the audience something that you wanted to, them to take away from this interview, what would be a key takeaway? What would be something that you'd want them to, you know, instill and 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 affect their life? Well, one thing, you know, I I, I had this. I made a movie. I've made a few movies, mm-hmm. and uh, in one of them, I I it was called "What Does It All Mean?" and I, you can't find the movie anywhere. But but um. It was looking into all kinds of spiritual belief systems. And one of the people that I've, he's gone now, but I interviewed him for this movie is a fellow named Eugene Morrow. And if you Google, if you go to YouTube and you you put in Eugene Morrow painter, you'll find this little piece I made for this movie. And I interviewed this guy Mm -hmm. and he was a really terrific painter. And I asked him, how did you learn to paint like this? And he said, well, I used to work for the city and I retired and I didn't know what to do with myself when I retired. So I asked my wife, what should I do? I'm bored. I don't know what to do. And she said, what did you want to do when you were a child? And that's one of that's what I would suggest people think about. What do you really want to do? And he and and his wife asked him that. What did you always want to do when you were a child? And he said, "Mm -hmm." he kind of laughed. He said, you know, I love to color. And she said, well, maybe you could paint. And he thought that was very funny. So he went to an art store and he was joking around with the woman at the art store saying, well, maybe I'll be the next Van Gogh. Well, I got to tell you, he could paint like Van Gogh. I mean, I'm not an art critic, so maybe not like Van Gogh, but he painted very much in that impressionistic style that Van Mm. Gogh had. And he sold a lot of paintings and he Mm. made money painting and he wasn't really trying to make money. But I would really suggest giving some thought to what did you, what's your dream? What you mm-hmm. always really want to do? What would be fulfilling for you? Yeah. Do it. Do it. Now, you might have to work at a job to earn some money while you're doing it. I'm, I can't tell you I'm making a lot of money writing my books. I'm making some money. Um, I'm also writing books for other people. And I, that's a fair amount of my living anyway now. Um, but that's so that's one thing is is what what did you always want to do? Because I wanted to write books and here I am writing books and uh, uh, um, people are reading them and they're writing nice things to me. They're making they're writing nice reviews on Amazon and so forth. Um, also, anything is possible. Mm. Anything is possible. I think it's important that you believe that. And if you don't believe it, maybe say a few prayers and see what happens, because mm. that's when they when they teach us to to uh, practice, you know, how do you come to believe in something? Well, act as if you believe in it, you know, and and uh, that meant praying as if I believed in something and so forth. And once I started doing that, all kinds of things happened, mm-hmm. you know, uh, find some kind of spiritual practice and engage in it and and uh, live that way. And and life will get better. Life mm-hmm. will get better. And again, anything is possible. Here I am. I've had cancer, surgery after surgery. I pooped out my stomach for a while. I mean, it's just anything can happen. And I don't know what will happen tomorrow. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my wife said, I'll never have a dog. And here we have a dog. I, we got our dog, my first dog in 50 years, my wife's first dog ever during COVID we got. And she's in love with this dog she, that she said she would never have it. The dog sleeps pressed up against her. And, uh, it's funny. So I love that. Awesome. Awesome advice. I love that. David, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you. I've really, really enjoyed it. I know the listeners will enjoy it as well. Um, such wonderful conversation, such depth of conversation and perception on life. We'll put all uh, links to you and your um, your books in the show notes. But thank you very much for taking the time. It's been so wonderful chatting with you. Thanks so much, Damien. I really appreciate you having me. Be well. 
Thank you for being part of the Share.Care community and helping people around the world prosper. You're creating a bigger pie for everyone to share. The more people contributing to the world being a better place, the better the world becomes for others and for you. Thank you.